It's a sickness. Really. Such a simple event that put a nagging feeling in the back of my mind. Something almost inescapable. After all, I didn't have to pick it up. I could have driven past it and let my uneventful and happy night end when I collapsed on my bed. But I didn't. How could I let such a thing go uninspected? See, this all started when I went to a friend's house in a little secluded neighborhood that no one would pay attention to if they were passing by it on the main road. A middle class to upscale neighborhood that for some reason lacked adequate street lighting. This friend Avery was holding a small get together for the release of Mortal Kombat X. He had two PS4s on two TVs and that was barely enough to serve the dozen or so people he had over. There were my best friends, some old friends I hadn't kept up with, and a few people that I met there that I connected with instantly. Also, did I mention that Mortal Kombat X was everything I wanted it to be? But it got to be around 2 in the morning and I was working at noon the next day, so I knew I had to leave soon. Not paying attention, I was getting very tired, to the point where driving would be hard. Still, I was getting the hang of the character Jackie Briggs, and I wanted to win with one of her brutalities. Whereas you win the last round, Jackie shoots electric into the ground and makes her opponent's feet and shins explode. It was hard to pull off at the time, and I stuck around another 30 minutes or so until I got it right. It was only as I got into my car that I realized my opponent might have let me pull it off on them. He did know I was trying to leave, but I was ready to go and fighting game time was over. The lack of streetlights is a little jarring. It's hard to explain just how dark it was. I could only see what my headlights would show me. I must have been rolling around that neighborhood at three miles an hour or so, afraid of hitting a black Escalade parked in an awkward manner. The roads were narrow. The design of the roads looped around in a series of T-shaped three-way intersections forming patterns of off-putting concentric circles that leave M.C. Escher stroking his beard in contemplation. Cruising at a snail's pace, I squinted at the road signs and the vagueness of the streets, trying to place where I was. I considered crashing at Avery's house until a road I passed by had a peculiar sight. When I think about it now, there was nothing too out of the ordinary about it. It just caught my eye in the way things do sometimes. For instance, you don't see a celebrity at the grocery store every day, you know? In fact, you rarely see that. Maybe you've never seen that. Still, that remains a totally normal occurrence, albeit memorable. This object I saw as simple as it was, began to weave a story in my head. The plot was foggy at best. It couldn't even really be called that. Not enough plot points. The only plot point I could really point to was this thing being discovered while driving at night. The pseudo-plot was more of a series of primal feelings. Feelings given strength and weight by my sleepless delirium. This thing was merely a red box. That's all. Just a red box placed slightly into the road. Just far enough into the road that one would need to nudge ever so slightly left of center to avoid hitting it. Placed perfectly as to be run over by the front right wheel of the next car to happen by. The eye-catching red almost pulled me towards it like a target in a light gun game. It was the only hint of chroma in the vacancy of those dark streets. Alas, I did manage to drive around it, or rather, pull up beside it. And there I sat for a while. There I was for a while, with my windows up and the door locked. I looked around me, and in all of my mirrors to assure myself that no one else was around. And there I was vulnerable. I felt vulnerable in my low horsepower car with lackluster pickup, alone and idle. But there was a sharp turn in my mind when I realized that if this thing was designed to make me stop, 
it worked, and the judgment I had was not to risk it anymore. I unbuckled my seatbelt and stridently but nervously walked around my car, still running, keys in the ignition, and picked up the box. I gently placed it in the passenger seat and drove off with my seatbelt off. Well, at the time, I was wondering why I did that, why I picked up that box. I mean, I had no reason to pick it up, sure, but I also didn't have a reason not to. It felt like an odd decision, but it wasn't until later that I noticed I hadn't paid attention to the simplest of things when I grabbed it. I didn't check its underside, its texture, or even its weight. I must have thought it was somewhat fragile with the way that I placed it in the car despite being afraid. Yet that begs the question, why was I afraid? Could it be that I perceived this thing to have some value? I did steal it after all, or maybe I didn't steal it. It was just out in the open, ready to be crushed by the next unsteady driver. Not unlike myself the night I found it. It's a wonder I didn't crush it then and there. Maybe if I did, it would have prevented all of this. But as things continue, I'm beginning to understand. This sickness is inevitable. It's something that I couldn't have contained no matter what. Once I pulled up to my driveway, I ran inside and grabbed a paper bag to put the red box inside. I felt that explaining why I picked up this red box to my roommate would be hard. It's just really abnormal behavior. After all, my roommate Chase isn't the most open-minded guy in the world. He wouldn't understand why I was drawn to this box. Hell, I don't understand why I was drawn to it. I mean, what if he understood what it was when I didn't? What if he knew what it was, and it was bad? Something illegal or dangerous? Something that I shouldn't bring into the house? Something that'd make me look stupid or naive? As I brought it in, I realized how badly I needed to piss, so I placed the bag with a box in it on our bathroom counter beside the sink. Yet as I undid my belt buckle, there was a sense of dread I felt. My genitals pulled upwards and my bladder clenched up like I was pissing right next to another man in a public bathroom where the dividers of the urinals are really, really small. Looking over at the brown paper bag, as opaque as the sewers are wet, I felt the presence of that box, like it was watching me. It was just a box, nothing that could observe me or watch me having a private moment. Yet still, even inside that bag that shielded a red wine from the sun, I felt like my intimate space was being intruded upon. So I quickly did up my belt buckle and walked carrying the bag to my room in a fashion similar to when I first picked up the box. Luckily, Chase was asleep in his room. After peeing, I retired to my room and stripped down to my underwear for bed. However, I woke up about 20 minutes later in a panic. You know that feeling that you get when you spontaneously feel like you're late for work? Checking the time, I tried to fall back asleep, but the panic got my blood pumping at waking levels. I struggled to keep my eyes closed. They kept opening back up almost of their own volition. I noticed the bag with a box in it again, sitting on my computer chair. I got up and curled up the top of the bag like you do with Chinese takeout, and I placed it in my closet, put dirty clothes over it. Then I closed the door. When my phone alarm woke me up, I was feeling groggy, and as I hit the showers, a thought popped into my head. Did I put the box on that chair last night? I mean... I couldn't conjure up a vivid memory of where I placed it in my room, just that I sat it down somewhere and quickly went off to piss. I was tired and preoccupied with something else, but I didn't remember putting it on that chair. To be fair, I didn't remember putting it on my bed or on the dresser or on my storage container, but I didn't remember putting it in that chair. Before heading out of the house, I checked the box to verify that it was real and not a dream. My fascination with this box felt dreamlike. In dreams, sometimes your motives are unclear and certain things are assumed for the sake of the dream storyline. 
but a dream wasn't going to explain this red box. At the guitar center where I work, my co-workers asked me about Mortal Kombat and how it was. He continued to ask polite questions about how it played and whether it was worth a purchase or a rental. But any thoughts I had on the subject weren't coming to my mind at the time. I just hoped that Chase wouldn't find the box. It was his day off and I'd better be there if I were going to explain it. But when I got home, I locked the door to my room and took out the box. Now I thought to analyze it. This red box had no openings to speak of, no visible seams or marks of construction. It felt smooth and lacquered despite mild imperfections in the thing's surface. It didn't feel dense. It felt rather light, but the way in which it weighed gave it a hollow feeling, as though it contained something inside that was sparse and hardly dense, that slowly moved where gravity pulled it. Yet it didn't move in a linear pattern like a sphere or a traditional three-dimensional shape. It was as off-kilter as an oblong, or even more so than that. It wasn't anything that I was accustomed to holding. I began to wonder if the internet had an answer, but then again, it's the kind of long-winded question Google gets stumped by. I tried an endless slew of searches on Google, Bing, and any other search engine that tolerate my questions. Redbox con, Redbox trick, Redbox hidden camera show, Redbox on street, Redbox on street at night, Redbox on street at night con, Redbox meaning. I got a lot of results relating to Redbox DVD and Blu-ray services but nothing would tell me what I had in my possession, and I wasn't going to ask anyone else in person. I couldn't be sure of how they'd react. It was my mystery, and no one else's it seemed. I continued to play with the box, moving it and shaking it gently, toying with it to understand what it contained. And as I did so, it began to feel... rougher in my hands. Not by much, but enough to notice. Like that lacquered feeling was wearing down. It imparted a dryness onto my hands I wasn't comfortable with, so I went to wash my hands. Chase asked me what I had been doing all day. I told him I had been playing Mortal Kombat and he asked to join me. He was insistent that we play right then and there, but I said I really wanted to finish the story mode alone first. After washing my hands, I quickly went to my room and set up my PS4 and MKX. I played the story mode on easy to establish an alibi, but the whole time, my attention was on the box, resting in the brown paper bag on the chair. When I finished beating Mortal Kombat, full focus on the red box resumed, and I was startled to see the sunrise. It had been an hour before work. I had spent approximately 14 hours looking at this red box. I'm fairly certain I didn't need anything, nor had I slept. Yet I wasn't the least bit hungry or tired while observing this box. I bagged up the box, changed clothes, and headed to Banera for breakfast and coffee, as my stomach was just now feeling empty. I prepared for another 8-hour workday, upsailing customers on no sleep. Avery texted me at work. He was having another get-together to play MKX and invited me over. I explained I was running on no sleep so I couldn't come. I knew I would crash the second I got home, probably for another 16 hours straight. And that's exactly what happened when I got home. But my mind wouldn't stop with this fixation on this stupid little box. The whole time I was in bed, I was dreaming about the box waking up every two hours or so feeling the dryness that I had felt on my hands, but all over my sides and my armpits. I'd have segments of my dreams where I was sitting in the room, looking at the box. That's all the dreams were. It would have been hard to tell that I was dreaming if not for the fact that I would periodically wake up in my bed. But when at last my alarm rang, giving me an hour or so to prepare for another day, I saw that the box was on the chair again, resting without the brown bag. 
I must have slept walked and pulled it up because I didn't remember getting it out the night before, nor do I remember doing anything in between my restless sleep. I had enough rest to go to work, but I felt a little more than stressed out, so I called my co-worker to cover my shift. So there I sat in bed, looking at this box in the office chair when my roommate walks in without knocking. He asked me if I was feeling okay. I said I was fine, but he didn't believe me. He offered to make me breakfast and I told him no, and I reminded him that knocking is polite. Luckily, he couldn't see the red box from the angle that he stood in the door frame. Once Chase left the house for work, I bagged up the red box and put it in my car. I needed to clear my mind and look at this thing from a fresh perspective. I took it to a secure area where I was sure I'd be alone. I continued my inspection and I could swear it was slightly heavier. It also seemed as though the small patterns of movement inside the thing that I had established changed. I had become so familiar with its design that any tiny change to the routine was turbulently jarring. Its dryness and texture also seemed to have plateaued, but it began imparting modest amounts of inhuman heat, a heat of a variety that you find emanating from a campfire, not from a handshake. Not not in the amount of heat, again it was very little heat, but it was that type of heat. Point is, it wasn't coming from my hands. I placed the box down and walked away. I felt as though this thing was guarding a secret. It was holding out on me. Perhaps walking away would make it feel comfortable. Perhaps it would slip up and reveal what it was keeping from me. But I realized that the sun was setting that such an attempt was paltry at best. It knew I was there. It was more aware of me than I was aware of it and gaining its secrets wouldn't be a matter of voyeurism. It had to trust me, or it needed time to tell me what it knew. I began to wonder just how sentient it was, how thoughtful, and I began to wonder if it enjoyed watching me struggle impatiently to understand its purpose. Still, I waited beside it on the hood of my car for a few more hours hoping in vain, but knowing I had lost that day. When I got home, Chase wanted to know what was in the bag. I told him it was medicine and that I didn't plan on going to work tomorrow. He asked me where I was and I said at work. He just rudely shook his head with an unjust look of disgust. He said, Something to the effect of, fine, don't tell me what's going on. I thought to myself, good, I won't. Not like you'd understand. I couldn't give up on this puzzle now. I could realistically take one more day off, so I decided to study that box that night and sleep the next night and return to work the day after that. That'd be enough time for sure. I sat there looking at this thing as I did so many times before. I can't be sure of when I noticed it, but it had moved. I was sure of it. It had moved away from me, by a good inch or so over the period of two or so hours. I don't think it happened when I was blinking. That would have been too abrupt for this box. It was constantly moving, slightly away. I didn't touch it for fear of making it shy. I focused my tunnel vision on this thing until I heard a door open and slam shut as my roommate left the house. My vision pulled out, and I thought it was time. It was time to touch it. Nervously, I leaned forward and petitely put my hands on either side of it, gingerly bringing them to grasp the red box full of mysteries. Success. This was a major breakthrough. The movement was real. A humble but nonetheless clearly present movement was taking place inside the box. It wasn't my imagination. It wasn't just placed in my way for no reason. 
there was something to behold inside this box. Its heat was equal to that of the heat felt by putting one's hand on an easy-bake oven. This was sufficient for now. I thought I'd take my box out for a trip to another secluded area. I began to hold it more. There was a distinct scurrying around inside the box. It was increasing its heat to the point where I could only hold on to it for a few seconds at a time. It was getting heavy enough to require me to use all of my arm and knee strength to lift it. It was jittering in place. It was becoming clear to me. It was becoming clear what it was I finally knew. Just as I'm sure you've guessed by now. <laughs> Honestly, I... I hope that my recounting of every detail hasn't made it too obvious what its purpose was. And I'd feel stupid if you told me that you understood at once what it was when I described it there on that road. So of course, I went to my truck and retrieved my baseball bat that I have for self-defense. And I cracked the thing open. And I felt stupid. So... So stupid. I felt my sanity rush out of me. I felt dread and a sense of emptiness. The conclusion I'm sure you came to as well was wrong. So wrong and empty and meaningless. I thought I had everything figured out and it'd all be over and worth it, but no. I was more confused than ever. The box was just... The box was just empty. So I left it there. I drove home. I slept. I went to work, and I was unhappy. Over the next month, I took a break from the whole thing, and I... I just did what I needed to live. But now, I think I'm ready. I'm ready to do what I need to. I'm going to go back into the habit because I have to. Just like you have to. I know how foolish I was to think that it'd be inside just one small box. No, no, no. That was just the beginning. It just showed me the way. It was a teachable moment in time. All so short. A tutorial on how this works. Practice. Mere practice. I'll start for real tonight. Confident, but, but humble. I can't use the bat again, that'd be obvious. That was only to start us out. So, I'll make sure that Chase stays still, but I need to use a kitchen knife to open him up. He'll hold a lot more secrets than that stupid box. Wish me luck.